great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Vegas Chamber in building your A-team from an Army Green Beret. My name is Chandler Fasciano, the event coordinator at the Vegas Chamber. And before we get started, I'd like to go over some features of this call. If you are using the desktop or mobile Zoom applications, you may type a question at any time using the question pane at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the, of the presentation. Likewise, you are highly encouraged to ask questions live. Use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. And as we open up for questions, we will call your name and unmute your line. Please ensure you are unmuted on your end and please keep questions brief so we can get to as many as possible. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Vegas Chamber President and CEO, Mary Beth Seawald. Thank you so much, Chandler. Thank you everybody for being with us today. We're so excited to have our friend, Green Beret Colby Jenkins with us today. Hey Colby, thanks for joining us. Yeah, we'll get to you in just a second. We're, we're just so excited to have you today, Colby, but we're also excited because our friends at the Nevada Military Support Alliance, has they've graciously uh, agreed to be the presenting sponsor of, of today's virtual event. I just wanna thank Vegas Chamber trustee, Teresa DiLoretto for her support and involvement in the Vegas Chamber. And Teresa, with that, I'll turn it over to you to say just a few words about the NMSA. Great, thank you, Mary Beth, and good morning, everyone. Before I talk about the Military Support Alliance, I'd like to recognize that, that on, on this call with us today is Nevada Military Support Alliance uh, founder, Chairman Emeritus, and my father, Perry DiLoretto, and our president, Dan Morgan. As a statewide 501c3, the foundation of the Nevada Military Support Alliance dates back to 2003 in response to the war on terror. In 2010, our mission was expanded to not only support military families of fallen service members, but to assist those returning home from the battlefield with catastrophic injuries. Our unwavering mission continues today to recognize and support the men and women of Nevada's armed forces, veterans, and their families. Our commitment to these men and women of Nevada's armed forces throughout the state is demonstrated by more than $9 million that we have raised and dispersed in support of death benefits to Nevada's men and women, 57 Gold Star families, the local portion of funding for the Fisher House on the VA campus in North Las Vegas, and the construction of four specially adapted homes with a fifth home currently under construction in Las Vegas for Sergeant Adam Poppenhouse and his family. These are just to name a few. In 2011, Nevada Military Support Alliance hosted Commander U.S. Special Operations Command General Doug Brown to be our keynote sp speaker at our inaugural gala in Reno. During final preparations and sound check for the event, we experienced technical difficulties and nearly a 45 minute delay. We had a four-star SOCOM commander and his guest waiting patiently for us to troubleshoot the problem so that he could proceed with his rehearsal. As my stress level continued to escalate, a kind, soft-spoken gentleman approached me, assured me the general was fine and that everything would work out not to worry. His words of sincerity, empathy, and leadership at that very moment had a calming effect. It just so happens that later that evening, during General Brown's presentation, the young man from earlier was introduced by General Brown as Green Beret Major, who just happened to be the subject of many stories throughout the evening. 10 years ago, I don't know that I ever thanked that Green Beret Colby Jenkins of words of encouragement and compassion. So Colby, thank you. The Nevada Military Support Alliance and our Board of Directors is proud to be a small part of bringing today's guest speaker, an American hero, outstanding leader, and my dear friend, Colby Jenkins. So welcome and thank you so much for being with us today. Well, Colby, she, she just gave you a better <clears throat> introduction than I think I could. Um, wow. <laughs> let me say just a couple more words about you and your background, and then we'll turn it over to you. Um, Colby, uh, you're a combat veteran who was deployed around the world with your Special Forces A-Team, of course, um, including Afghanistan, South American countries of Colombia, 
uh, Paraguay, and then other government businesses took you to the Philippines, um, Malaysia, Indonesia, Iraq, just to name a few. Um, you also are, uh, you teach as an adjunct professor in at George Washington University's Graduate School of Political Management. Um, you are currently a program manager in the Silicon Valley tech industry, um, just to name a few. Google recognizes you as a trainer and speaker, sending you all over the world. So we're very pleased and honored today to have you as our guest speaker at the Vegas Chamber. So once again, Colby, thank you for joining us and thank you for your service to our country. Well, it's my great pleasure to be here and, and well, I could just continue to have a great conversation with Teresa and Mary Beth and call it a day. That What great memories and and great friendships that go back a decade. That, that's tremendous. So thank you very much for that generous introduction and, and, and fun trip down memory lane. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen and then we will get underway here. Stand by. Okay, are we seeing my screen okay? Yes, we are. Okay, great. The bullets from a Taliban machine gun can bring down even the mightiest of US Army helicopters and bring down my helicopter while in combat in Afghanistan, they did. Now I guarantee you on that particular day, we did not enter our helicopters, go into combat, attack our target and plan to get shot down. How many of you have ever gotten on a helicopter with the intent of getting shot down? No one, that does not cross your mind. That's not in the plans. It's not something you generally anticipate. But on that particular day, it happened. The challenge in those types of situations, when the unexpected occurs, when obstacles emerge that you may not have anticipated or prepared for, the challenge then becomes, what do you as the leader do to overcome those obstacles? More importantly, how do you build a team, an A team, that is capable of overcoming the unexpected and continuing to accomplish the mission. How do you build an A-team to overcome a pandemic for all the tremendous circumstances we've experienced over the last now year? It's crazy to think it's been a year. Well, with more than 20 years of experience as a Green Beret, having led Special Forces A-team around the world, there's one thing I have learned, and that is that the enemy always gets a vote in any operation, no matter how much we planned for, how much we rehearsed and prepared for that particular mission, the enemy got a vote. As we came into that target area, the enemy machine gun placed its vote. We are going to interrupt this mission. We're gonna shoot down a helicopter that I was on and the operation changed, but the mission did not. But during this presentation, I'm going to share some other experiences and finish the rest of that story that will hopefully lend vision and ideas to you on how to strengthen your own leadership potential and along the way build your own A-team. After all, you, you do not need to wear body armor and carry a rifle to build or be a member of an A-team. That is not a requirement. It just happened to be so when I was in the Special Forces. But first, before I continue, and as as perfectly highlighted by Teresa and the, and the work that the Nevada Military Support Alliance does. I, I am just a small humble snapshot of the thousands and millions that have served and continue to serve on our behalf, both in uniform and outside the uniform like the NMSA. While I may be speaking a lot about myself today, it's not as a point of vanity it's simply a humble snapshot that will allow you to see through my experiences and gain greater respect and honor those who continue to serve on our behalf. Let us always honor and think of them. Well, today I'm gonna to take you back to Afghanistan and share with you my learning laboratory where I learned some of these stories and experiences that I will share with you. And maybe we'll transition to some leadership ideas and then finally, how to build your own AT. So first, come back with me to Afghanistan, where while I was there, I had the opportunity to host Tom Brokaw and an NBC News crew. They had set out across the world to film a special war on terror uh, television program. Now, this was back in the early 2000s, 2005. 
when the war on terror was 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 hammering, when when tensions were high, and the news really wanted to get to the front lines. So NBC went exactly there. They went to my special forces base out on the frontiers of Afghanistan, and and we hosted Brokaw for a special uh, program. Let me transition to a video clip. NBC News in depth tonight, more on the war on terrorism. For the last two days in Afghanistan, American and Afghan forces have been fighting intensely with militants tied to the outlawed Taliban. It's been going on in two southern provinces. It's described as the deadliest fighting there in almost a year. More than 60 rebels and at least nine Afghan soldiers have been killed, seven Americans wounded. Tom Brokaw has just returned from a remote and hostile part of southern Afghanistan with an American special forces team. This is the U.S. Army's version of a wagon train trying to tame the frontier of southeastern Afghanistan. It is a joint patrol of American Special Forces and the new Afghan National Army, which has grown to 32,000 troops, almost twice as large as the American military presence in this country. They're hoping to bring peace and win friends in the village of Bagh, a tiny, impoverished collection of mud homes and simple shops. For security reasons, we can't show the faces of Commander Captain Colby Jenkins and members of his Special Forces team who have been working this area for seven months. Today, Captain Jenkins lets his Afghan counterpart, Captain Ramatula, take the lead. This is a Jirga kind of town meeting as the Special Forces continue their dialogue with these men, winning their hearts and minds because just north of here, about two hours, is a major Taliban region and they want to keep this part of the pass secure. With the children looking on and the women of the village out of sight, the elders, all men, are friendly but wary. Almost all of them voted in the historic presidential election last fall, but like voters everywhere, they're impatient for more help. Back in Afghanistan, in the wild, Captain Jenkins and his special forces team return to their base, winding through the broad scenic river valley where nothing seems amiss. When you look out on this valley, to me, it just seems peaceful and pastoral. What does it look like to you? Uh, pretty much the same, but with a lot of uh, hidden mysteries, a lot of history, a lot of uh, people struggling to uh, progress. And by the way, just two days after Tom's visit, Captain Jenkins and his men were helicoptered to another special forces base where they were involved in a major firefight attacking a regional headquarters. When we... So that was my learning laboratory, my battleground, if you will, of where I learned many lessons that helped me progress as a leader and help my A-team really solidify. But before I continue, let me just pause to, to share just a brief uh, caveat about Tom Brokaw. Tom Brokaw is a great example to me of personal, humble leadership and just good humanity. Despite his tremendous fame and connections throughout the world, uh, Tom, after his departure with me and once he returned home to the States, he didn't forget about us. He took the time to call my wife. He called my wife, not only my, my wife, but my parents and my grandfather and told each of them that Colby's fine, he's doing okay, I was just with him and he'd been doing well. And not only did he, he call, but he sent them each an autographed book, uh, The Greatest Generation. And then over the ensuing, what now, almost 14 years, he's continued to remain a, a dear mentor and friend. Uh, he attended my promotion in Washington, D.C. He invited Heather and I to, to two different banquets where he was honored. But the point is that he taught me is that no matter how big he is, he never forgot about the little people, one of them being me. And those simple acts of kindness as a tremendous leader and personality forever shaped my life, forever impacted my life for good. So the lesson to be shared there is no matter how big you may be or think you are or may become, if, even if you wear four stars on your collar, like some of the military leaders I worked with, never forget the little people that you interact with on a daily basis and how a little act of kindness or remembrance can 
can have a dramatic positive impact on their lives. Um, I challenge each of you to consider that and, and the example that, that Tom has set for me. Let's see. Slides locked up on me just a second. Sorry about that. So now as we transition from the Afghan battlefield to your battlefield, your battlefield is different. Our battlefields in the business world are different. You, you, you do not necessarily squat like this picture illustrates with, with tribal leaders wearing, wearing uh, uh, head, headdresses and, and, and different uh, clothes than we wear. Uh, your tribal leaders are, are very much different but they are tribal leaders. There are different tribes, different key leaders that you have to interact with out on your battlefield. And how can you as a leader do that effectively? Well, these are some of the, the ingredients that I'm going to share today that, that will contribute to that. How to have a strong foundation, how to persevere or, or never quit. And if you are gonna quit, just quit tomorrow. How to exercise the understanding and mercy, and then when in charge, be in charge. Now, all of those fundamentals contribute to leadership that then lends itself nicely to building your own A team, how to qualify with your team, how to get to know your team and bring them together out of individual silos so that they have that A team mentality and, and that shared responsibility towards mission accomplishment. But if there's one image that I hope you'll take away from today, if you remember anything from what I'm sharing, it's this image. Take a brief moment and, and imagine yourself as the lighthouse in this picture. What is going through your mind? What types of feelings or emotions are you experiencing if you were this lighthouse in the midst of this storm? Now, what does a lighthouse do? What purpose does it serve? Well, in this example, a lighthouse stands against the withering storms. A lighthouse stands firm it has a solid foundation upon which it grounds itself and marks where danger exists. A lighthouse provides light to those who may be out to sea, tossing to and fro in the waves in the storm, who are looking for direction. A lighthouse provides that direction. It tells those who are looking towards it that, hey, here where I stand is danger. I've experienced it. You do not need to experience it. Instead, go over there. I will point you to safe harbor. Follow my light, follow my lead. My challenge to you today is be the lighthouse. Be the lighthouse for those that you lead. Be the lighthouse for yourself. Stand firm when the waves of life are beating upon you. Stand solid and point to safe harbor away from the obstacles or dangers that you've experienced so that those that you lead will not have to experience the same. Be the lighthouse. That's my message today, be the lighthouse. Now, along the way of being a lighthouse, you have to have a solid foundation and several ingredients contribute to that. One is authenticity or being the best you. So I love this picture of me with some of my high school baseball friends who to this day, if I walked in a room after 25 years of, of separation, if I walked into the room and, and tried to be somebody or pretend I'm somebody who I really am not, if I tried to fake the funk or, or just, just over, overstep my, my headlights, they would quickly bring me back into my place. They would help me be grounded. Surround yourself with people who believe in you, who encourage you to be the best you. How many of you have met someone who you can quickly pick up on that, that they're not, they're just fake. <laughs> they're not really in it to get to know you. They're, they're, they're using you as a step, stepping stone to something else or someone else. As a leader, it's important to be the best you, be authentic. And along the way, that will contribute a solid brick in your foundation, in your, your goal to be that, that lighthouse for others. Next, believe in yourself. A lighthouse has to believe in its solid foundation or it's gonna wither and or it's gonna sway and fall as the storm beats upon it. Believe in yourself. Now, this is a picture of me with some of my team over the jungles of Colombia. Now, we didn't just enter into a helicopter and go into battle without adequate preparation or confidence. How did we gain that? Well, that confidence and that belief in ourselves began long before we ever received a mission. 
It began with our training, with our initial organization, with our getting to know each other and building those relationships of trust. And then once we receive a mission, now we begin to plan, we begin to hearse, we begin to train and retrain and talk about contingencies so that when that helicopter arrives and we enter, belief in ourselves is already solid. That belief has now become confidence. Each of you, as you embark upon your day, going into the business battlefield that you encounter, you have a figurative helicopter that swoops into your front doorstep, and picks you up and takes you off to battle. How do you enter that helicopter when it lands? Do you enter it hesitatingly? Do you enter it with a little bit of unsurety about yourself and about what you're about to embark upon? Or do you enter it confidently, knowing that the, the preparation you've taken or the challenges of the day that you will encounter with the best that you can bring to bear for that particular battle. Believe in yourself long before the helicopter ever arrives. Step into that helicopter with confidence and embark upon battle that you will face for that day. Now, along the way, it's also important to recognize you will simply not know the answers to everything. It's impossible. The principle of humility contributes tremendously to a solid foundation which this picture of me with Admiral Winnefeld, my last boss in the Pentagon that I served, the number two man for the entire US military. This is a picture of he and I at a congressional hearing where he was testifying before Congress about the Department of Defense budget, a very complex topic that's really impossible to know everything about. Well, this picture illustrates where he received a question that he did not know the answer to. And rather than try and him and ha or provide a half-hearted answer or, or shirk the, the, the question and, and move on to something else, he simply said, Congressman, I, I do not know. Let me get some help. As a leader, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to turn to those experts that are on your team who may know the answers. Showing that sense of humility and that ability to say, hey, I don't know, but I will find out contributes tremendous to a solid foundation as a leader. Be authentic, believe in yourself and have that confidence and then be humble, exercise humility with those that you lead and your foundation will stand firm as the waves beat about you. Now, as those waves are pummeling you or the unexpected is emerging like the Taliban machine gun in my example, as those targets pop up, uh, the waves are beating upon you, it's important to recognize you've got to persevere you as the leader, as the lighthouse, have got to stand solid. Well, how do you do that? Well, my grandfather told me before I entered the U.S. Army Ranger School, he whispered a little secret to me, which this picture on the left illustrates of Ranger students going through the, the swamps of Florida. My grandfather told me, hey, Colby, if you're going to quit, just quit tomorrow. I thought about that for a minute, and as I got into Ranger School, it quickly became evident to me as Ranger School is designed to make you want to quit every single day. It's designed to push you to your breaking point and then some to measure you. How are you going to step up when you're at your wits end? How are you going to lead when you're in that situation? Well, as those days in Ranger School chewed themselves up, chewed me up, and I found myself wanting to quit, I would tell myself, okay, I'm just going to make it, I'm going to make it to the next objective. And then, and then I'll reevaluate. I'll wake up tomorrow and maybe that'll be it. I made it this far, I'll just quit tomorrow. But as that attitude of, of mild perseverance built upon day upon day and week upon week, I found myself quitting tomorrow when tomorrow kept coming and going. And before I knew it, I had graduated. That attitude of just making it to tomorrow, persevering, never quitting today will help you gain momentum in those moments of extreme difficulty. If you're gonna quit, just quit tomorrow. The other example that reinforced this for me is, is my experience in swimming with my daughters. So I have two daughters who my wife and I swear were born half mermaid. They are tremendous swimmers and they've swam all their lives. And I've spent a lot of time, countless hours at swimming pools, but rarely was I the one in the water swimming. No, instead I was the one sitting on the bleachers cheering for my daughters. So when we lived in the San Francisco area, my daughters learned about the San Francisco Bay Shark Fest, the escape from Alcatraz swim event. And they came to me and said, dad, 
we want to do it. We want you to swim with us. So they talked me into it. We paid our money, we registered, and off I went. I began to train in a nice, warm, climate-controlled, smooth, open water swimming pool to where I could now swim confidently that the distance that would be required to swim from the island of Alcatraz to the shores of San Francisco. So the morning of the event came, here's the picture of us before confidently standing before the starting line. As the whistle blew and off we went, I quickly found myself in a complete sense of panic. My daughters quickly left me and, and I was eating their bubbles. I was getting pummeled, my goggles getting knocked off, getting pushed underwater in the, in the chaos of the start. And I found myself thinking, what in the world have I got myself into? I'm gonna drown. There is no way I'm getting from here to shore. There, there's no way. And as I continued to struggle and doggy paddle, I noticed a small jet ski off to the side towing a raft for people like me who were struggling, who were considering quitting. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll just, I'll hang in there. And I looked up and I noticed a big orange buoy, like the, pit, the one in the picture to the right. And I noticed this big orange buoy and I locked on it and I started to think, okay, get to the orange buoy, then we'll, then we'll, we'll think about it. Ugly doggy paddle, breaststroke. I made it to the, the first orange buoy and I noticed the next orange buoy. Kept swimming and I noticed the next orange buoy. And before long, I started gobbling up these orange buoys that were leading me back to shore where I needed to go. What I learned from this instance was from where I began at Alcatraz in San Francisco Bay with the sharks, from that starting point, looking from there to the destination, the shoreline, there was no way I was gonna make it. My mind had locked on from here to there with nothing in between to pull me along and the panic almost, over, over, almost over, overtook me. But as I identified those big orange buoys or in our business life, in our business battlefield, those milestones, those project timelines, those, those, those critical intermediate goals that pull you towards a, a product launch or successful mission accomplishment. The importance of identifying those big orange buoys that will allow you to lead your team and pull them along is critical. Rather than just say, hey team, we're here, we're going there, good luck. Instead, say, hey team, here's where we're at. Here's where we're going to, but along the way, we're gonna hit these milestones. We're gonna clear these benchmarks. And as we do, we're gonna build momentum. We're gonna overcome the little objectives, the little uh, obstacles that may impede our progress in between, but they're not gonna set us back from ultimate mission accomplishment. Identify those big orange buoys and pull yourself along. Now, as you do so, it's important to forget yourself and serve. The best way to overcome one's uh, feeling sorry for yourself is to lift your head up and find someone around you who has it just a little bit worse than you. I guarantee you there's somebody on your team today who's having just a little bit worse of a day than you are. The trick then becomes finding that person and helping him or her. As you forget yourself and serve, you quickly forget about your own struggles and you help someone else overcome theirs. And along the way, you, for, you gain a forever friend. If you're gonna quit, just quit tomorrow and forget yourself and serve others along the way. And you'll find yourself staggering up the shoreline like I was in this picture. I barely made it, but I made it. Now, along the way, as you're leading your teams, it's important to recognize that people make mistakes. Nobody plans to make mistakes. Now, these two pictures represent two dynamic, critical pinnacle moments in my career as a Green Beret. One is as a crazy wild man in Afghanistan with a beard and, and uh, Grizzly Adams out on the frontier chasing bad guys. Uh, the next is me departing the White House West Wing after giving a, an out brief to national security staff about hostage rescue operations in Colombia to bring back our American hostages two incredible moments that have forever impacted my life that would have never happened had I not encountered a critical leader in my path that helped me overcome a fatal mistake, a near fatal mistake. So before becoming a Green Beret, we have to first be selected. We have to go through an arduous selection process. 
multiple weeks of physical, mental, and, and, and emotional training, uh, uh, testing, and evaluation. One of these testing events, physical and, and mental testing events, requires us to navigate over land for tremendous distances, orienteering, land navigation, with a ton of weight on our backs, by ourselves, operating in an enemy territory scenario. So as you navigate this difficult terrain, going from point to point, light, daylight to darkness to rivers, up and down mountains, long terrain, you can't just walk down the middle of the road with a white flashlight. You know, you have to navigate as if you're in enemy territory. It's, it's tricky. But along the way, there are some critical pieces of equipment that help you. One is a map and the other is a protractor that helps you mark your azimuth or your path that you should follow. Now to secure those, we put the map in a waterproof pouch. That pouch has a lanyard that we put around our neck like a necklace. And then we took that pouch securely down the front of our shirt. And then we move, we move out, we, we land navigate, we're up and down the terrain. Now along the way, it's important to pull that map out, get down in the prone, laying on the ground, pulling your poncho liner out over you to, to, to cover the, the red flashlight that you need to, to see the map. And this is called a map tech. So there was one instance where I'm doing a map tech I'm checking the map, identifying in my head where I'm at, confirming I'm on track, and off I went. After doing this map check, I put the map back in the pouch. I put the pouch securely back down the front of my shirt to, to keep it safe, and off I went. Now another three, four hours passed, and I needed to do another map check. Just confirm, I'm, I think I'm where I'm at. Let me, let me look on the map. So I lay down in the prone, I pull my poncho liner out, and I go to retrieve my map and it's gone. I have lost my map. Fatal mistake in land navigation, especially when you're being tested to be a Green Beret. I lost my map. There was, there was no way I was gonna find it by backpacking through the mountains for several hours, no, over the dark. There was no way I was gonna find it. And I clearly remembered putting that map back in the pouch because what I'd failed to do is put that lanyard back around my neck like a necklace to secure that pouch. Instead, I just stuffed it down my shirt. And over the course of the next three to four hours, it just worked its way free down and out of my shirt and off it was lost. So in that instance, if that were to happen to a, to a student training, we're instructed to go to the nearest road, sit on our rucksack and await pickup. You're, you're over, you're, you're, you're done. So there I sat on my rucksack and, and up pulled this truck and out stepped two gentlemen as they came over to me, I quickly noticed that one of the gentlemen was the commander for the entire Special Forces selection course. Not just anyone, but the commander. And as I explained my situation to him, he pulled out his grading book. He looked at my roster number and he looked at my performance. And he noticed that to date, I had done well. Sure, I wasn't a perfect candidate, but I had done well. I'd, I had met the, the minimums. I had exceeded them. I'd been doing well. I had simply made a mistake. And as he talked to me about that, he helped me realize that this mistake did not need to mean that my career, my dreams as a Green Beret were over. So he pulled out a new map. He marked on it where we were currently located. And he looked at me and said, you know what? You're several hours behind. I don't know if you're going to make it. We're going to give you another chance. Out you go. Back on the course I went and the rest is history. I somehow made it. But in that moment, he taught me a powerful lesson. Despite that tremendous mistake I made, he told me and he demonstrated to me that, hey, with some retraining, with tremendous performance to date, you had done well, you just simply made a mistake, you're gonna get another chance. As a leader, it's important to exercise understanding and mercy. It's important to know that your teammates, they do not wake up and say, okay, at 10 o'clock, I'm going to make my first mistake. And, and then maybe at 2.30, I'm going to throw in another mistake just for good measure. No, nobody plans their day and plans to make mistakes, but mistakes happen. You then, as a leader, it's important to pick your teammates up when they do make mistakes, provide retraining, provide clarity, direction, help them see where the mistake happened and how it can be avoided in the future. Ensure there is accountability. We don't just overlook mistakes but we help our people, our teammates, those that we are leading and our peers, and most importantly, ourselves. We help in these situations to see that, that success can still be achieved. 
obstacles and mistakes can still be overcome. That Taliban machine gun, when it fires up and lights up your helicopter, you can still overcome that. You can still succeed. Exercise understanding and mercy as a, as a leader and help your teammates remain on course when they make mistakes. And finally, as a leader, when in charge, be in charge. The story that really taught me this was at the end of my training as a Green Beret candidate, as a student, they bring all of the students together and they put us on a student A team. These student A teams are comprised of usually two student captains. Now a real A team only has one captain, the, the, the commander of the team. But in the student training environment, there are two. And they put us in a, in a guerrilla warfare scenario where this student team, we've all been trained now in our expertise, we have to come together and exercise guerrilla warfare, counterinsurgency operations, and be evaluated to see if we can complete this final step. So at the beginning of this exercise for me, my student team has dropped off at the start point. We have all of our bags, our weapons, our equipment, a heap of dust, chaos. We're, we're not quite organized yet, not quite sure what's going on. And there we stand, myself and this other student captain. And up walk to us, our evaluator, the gentleman who's going to determine if we passed or failed. And he looked at both of us, myself and the other captain, and he said, who's in charge here? Quickly in my mind, I thought, boy, there's this chaos behind me. Confusion does not make for a good first impression. Am I in charge of this? Could this be my one, my first, second, and third strike all at all in once? He asked again, who's in charge here? And I quickly answered, I am. And the evaluator looked down at his notebook, made a little mark, and turned around and walked away. And I thought, oh boy, what, what just happened here? We proceeded with our, our training with the missions. And at the end of the evaluation, that same evaluator, when talking to me about my performance, he said, do you remember in the beginning when I asked who was in charge? And I said, yeah, I've been dying to understand what, what happened there. He said, that was the first test. They purposely didn't tell us who would be in charge from the beginning. They wanted to note when in the absence of command, in the fog of war, in that situation, who would step up, who would lead, who would be in charge when there needed to be someone to take charge. And I passed that first test. In the moment of uncertainty, whether you're the leader or you're in a group, direction needs to be provided. Do not be afraid to be the one to stand up like this woman in this picture illustrates. Stand up, lean in, when in charge, be in charge, certainly when it's appropriate. Now there are instances where it may not be appropriate, but when it is, stand up, be in charge. And I love this other picture that shows me shaking hands with a Taliban leader in Afghanistan. Now this was a Taliban guy who we had chased for weeks. We had tried to kill or capture him, but we had missed him several times. But by working with local tribal leaders, finally bringing them into the fold and uniting ourselves in combined authority and, and, and um, power for that area, we were able to bring this Taliban leader in peacefully. There was an absence of unity in command. And through my efforts and our team's efforts and our Afghan counterparts, we were able to unite together as one broad, diverse team and bring about a peaceful solution. If we had fragmented authority, fragmented leadership, this would have never happened. And we would have continued to chase this guy around for, for weeks, possibly. Now, as you arrive at this, this leadership juncture and you find yourself with a new team, or whether it's an existing team, how do you help build that sense of, hey, we are not just a group of people, we are an A team. So this picture is a, is a, is a shot of me with my A team in Afghanistan and a couple of gentlemen who were supporting us, who were attachments with new and unique characteristics. Now an A-team is comprised of different expertise, weapons, engineering, communications, medical, diverse expertise that have to come together to be a team, one united front. How do you do that? How do you bring together the best of the best, the best in the, their particular field and help them perhaps shed a little bit of ego for the greater good? Well, first, it's important to qualify, to get to know your team. Now, this picture shows me in the center in my black jacket, tan hat, leaning in, spending time with those tribal leaders that would later comprise 
the team that I needed to bring about peaceful solutions to this area. I had to take time to get to know my team, both my direct A team, but also those who we were working with as partners or in our business world as potential clients. Taking the time to get to know them, what are the buttons that, that we should push to help them be motivated? What buttons should we avoid? What are their fears? What are their desires for their sphere of influence? If I had not taken that time to get to know them, to sit in those dry riverbeds, to drink that green yucky tea with those tribal leaders day after day, I would have never qualified in their eyes to lead. Taking the time to build those relationships of trust, to getting to know your team as individuals first and teammates and expertise second will build a gel and a glue across your team that will solidify as you then move forward towards each mission. Now, as you do so, it's important to recognize that yes, they, each teammate has individual expertise. They are a team first. Now, Green Berets, they don't like to be known by their individual expertise or labeled, if you will. They don't like to, be, to hear the captain say, hey, I need two weapons guys and two engineers and one medic. No, the Green Berets, they see themselves as Green Berets first and a medic or a weapons guy second. On your team, it's important to treat your teammates as Green Berets first and an expertise second. For example, as you, as you scan across the, those who may report to you or those who are, you are working with, avoid seeing people as a label or as say a program manager or a software engineer or a product developer. No, as you scan those who you work with, see them as people first as Bob or Sally or Nancy or John, and then expertise second. Avoid those labels that we can quickly fall in that lead people to become stovepiped and break them away from that sense of shared responsibility for the mission. Treat them as Green Berets first, as people first, and expertise second. And as you do so, you will find yourself having success in very unconventional environments. Now, I promised you that I would, would share the rest of my story as, as we were coming into that, that target on that particular day. I had my team split on two Chinook helicopters. The Chinook helicopters have, are the largest, have those two rotors front and back, almost like a flying bus. My Chinook was in lead and as it took immediate direct fire, my helicopter began to lose lift. Now my trail element had to immediately flare and fly around to the far side of the target and as my Chinook lost lift, we were able to dismount, jump off the helicopter as it got close enough to the ground, high on a ridgeline with the Chinook just enough lift that it was able to clear the ridgeline and execute a hard landing on the far side of the valley. So there we were, my team now divided, a Taliban hostile element between us and us maneuvering towards each other, firing at each other with the Taliban between us. Now in that moment of chaos, I could have quickly called a ceasefire because we were shooting essentially at each other. But the way that we survived that day was each of my teammates, each man on my team, when the chaos, the obstacle emerged, the unexpected happened, they didn't lose their mind. They remembered the basics, shoot, move and communicate. Identify your target, shoot, move and communicate. As we executed those basics, we survived that day. Now the bad guys had a very bad day, but we came back alive. As you lead your team and encounter the unexpected obstacles, it's important to encourage them to not lose their minds, to not throw the baby out with the bathwater when an obstacle emerges. No, flex, execute a contingency. Remember the basics that got your team to that particular juncture and execute them. What were the basics? What have you succeeded on before? How can you draw on that previous success to overcome the current obstacle and continue march? Now, along the way, it's, it's easy as you achieve success to let your chest maybe puff out a little bit, to let pride creep in to your, your attitude or, the, or your sense of team. I would encourage you to be like the Green Berets are. Now, our motto, our, our official motto is quiet professionals. We let our actions speak louder than our words. I didn't just go to Afghanistan with my team to say we were going to help the people. We did. We put the teddy bears in their hands. 
we brought peace and security to the best that we could to those valleys that we served in. We let our actions speak louder than our words. Build and lead your team to be a group of quiet professionals. You do not want to be that team that walks into a room or a conference room who others look at and then begin to roll their eyes and go, oh boy, not those guys again. We don't want to work with them. No, you want your team to walk into a room and have people turn towards you and want to work with you because you let your actions speak louder than your words. The insignia for Green Berets is crossed arrows, like my logo illustrates there, crossed arrows. Notice they are arrows, they are not cannons or bazookas or rockets. No, we are crossed arrows because we hit our target without anyone knowing where we came from or how we got there. We're not a bazooka or a cannon. As you maneuver through the unexpected, as you maneuver towards your goals and your missions, be that group of quiet professionals that hits the target without anyone knowing how that happened. So that when that final piece of the puzzle needs to put in, your teammates rally. They rally together. They elevate the closest person, the person most capable of completing the puzzle, and off it goes. Nobody cares about the credit. Nobody cares about the fame or the spotlight. They just care about completing the puzzle. Now, along the way, you're going to this list picture at the bottom is, is somewhat cheesy, but it illustrates a powerful point. You're going to encounter lots of sharks in the water out there with lots of as we navigate the big ocean as a singular goldfish, that shark can pick us off one by one. But you as the leader, you as the lighthouse, rallying your teammates together, can come together as even a larger shark and turn those sharks away and remain safe and protected. When those unexpected obstacles, those sharks emerge in your project plan or your budget uh, goes awry or your timeline is now busted, something happens that you hadn't anticipated. Rally your guppies together, rally your people together, point to safe harbor, remember the basics and the success that got you to that point, and off you go. Be the lighthouse, point to safe harbor, mark where danger exists. You've experienced it. You have the confidence because you've overcome the unexpected before. Now shine the path to success for those that are looking to you for direction. And along the way, I know you will achieve it. I know your team will be the A team that you desire. Remember, you do not need to have body armor or a rifle to lead or build an A team. You just simply have to lead. And please know that I will be your teammate. You can count on me to join you in your fight in the battlefield that you encounter each day. It would be my honor. And with that, I wish you all the best of luck and I look forward to seeing you on the high ground. Thank you. I'm happy to take your questions now. Colby, thank you so much. What an excellent presentation. And uh, it, it's fascinating to hear your stories, um, you know, from Be the Lighthouse. So many great messages. Have mercy, right? Because like you say, none of us goes into work every day thinking we're going to make any mistakes. Um, just so many things. And one of the things you said was shed your ego as well. And a friend of mine just wrote yesterday, the richness of our lives is directly related to how well and how honestly we see ourselves, acknowledge and work daily to, to mitigate weakness and never ever forget that ego is and always will be the enemy. I think it sounds like you've probably come across that quote before since you were talking about shed, shed your ego. Yeah, I haven't came across that specific one, but it certainly parallels with, with, with my experience and what I've seen for good and bad when that, when that is heated and when it is not. Now, yeah. I, my years, as you all can attest, working in government, there are varying shades of egos in, in, in the government <laughs> sector. Yes, definitely. Well, um, we, it looks like we have a special guest, Teresa DiLoretto, um, Perry DiLoretto, who's the, the founder of the Nevada Military Support Alliance and, and knows uh, Colby Jenkins pretty well. Um, Perry, if you can unmute yourself, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you. And Colby, uh, it's great to see you. I'm really pleased and happy that you put up the scruffy picture. That's the Colby <laughs> that I remember with the beard and long hair. And that was a great event. And uh, talk about leadership. Um, 
what you and other members of the uh, military have done for our organization to help keep us on focus and provide what leadership we can to the civilian community with respect to the necessity of continued support for our veterans, our active duty and their families. Uh, we've enjoyed tremendous success in Nevada in that mission. And a lot of it has to do with the likes of you, General Brown and others that have been so willing to take their time and come over and, and help us move forward. Um, as we continue to move forward with that uh, path that we're on to provide that support, the critical nature of the mission uh, becomes so more, much more apparent uh, and important every day. And uh, I, uh, I wanna take this opportunity to thank you again and let you know that uh, the Matter Military Support Alliance is alive and well and functioning. Uh, thank you to the great leadership that you uh, have uh, helped us with. So thank you again very much. You bet. My pleasure, Perry. Like Tom Brokaw, it's same, same lessons I learned. I remember meeting Perry for the first time and thinking, wow, he's taking the time to talk to me. <laughs> and, and so many others, Mary Beth, Teresa, everyone I met at that, if that one event, I mean, it's, a, it's incredible how one event can, can bring so much richness into your life. So I, you know, I've never forgotten that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Colby. Um, and again, to anyone uh, watching today, we're happy to take your questions or comments. Uh, we can unmute you and uh, or you can type your questions in the Q&A. I know, Colby, I, I think I saw you post a picture on, on social media where you recently went to D.C. and, and served during the recent um, the, when the protesters breached the U.S. Capitol. Are you able to talk to us about what that was like? Yeah, I uh... So after my active duty time, I stayed on in the National Guard. Um, I'm, a, I'm now a colonel in the Army Guard and continue serving. And, and it, it was both fortunate and fortunate that I got mobilized uh, to go back. Who, who would ever imagine talking to soldiers on Capitol Hill about situations where they might have to raise their rifle against a fellow American? And, and those were the situations we found ourselves in. And it was, it was frustrating is the wrong word, sad is maybe too strong, but it was, it was complex. Um, but it was also important that we could fulfill that mission, uh, continue to support and defend our constitution. Um, my specific role was I was the Army National Guard uh, liaison to the Secret Service. So I, I was in the Secret Service uh, com Command and Communications node for the whole inauguration event. And just seeing the dedication and, and boy, they, there's very little, if anything, that gets past the Secret Service during times like that. And it was, I've worked in, in with some uh, incredible capabilities on multiple battlefields, but the Secret Service is, is uh, very capable. And uh, so it was neat that I was able to see that, but then also help coordinate our, our army operations with what the Secret Service needed to do. Um, but yeah, you know, to this day, we still have troops there. You know, they were just extended uh, till, through May. And uh, without being too political, it's it's, it's very frustrating for those men and women on the ground still. I mean, I was just thinking about you when I saw your post and you were being deployed, did that just blow your mind to think uh, of all times and all places for you to be deployed? It was to our United States Capitol. It, it really was. And, and, it, and it just compounded as I was there. And each day we received four to 7,000 new soldiers every day. I go into the armory to see the general go back to my post and, and there were just bus after bus of soldiers flowing in. It was, we were just on top of each other and, and to see that happening. Yeah, it was, uh, it wasn't, it was chaotic, but it was also reassuring to see how we could do that. We mobilized, there was an element from every state and territory in the United States there, even Guam, Alaska had elements there. Um, so the to bring that show of force to the Capitol and, and, and not have a catastrophic, catastrophic event um, really speaks to you know, the capability of our armed, armed services. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you again for going and doing that. I know you had to leave your family like all of our service people do, but uh, I felt, actually, I felt a little more comfortable knowing that you were there. Well, well thank you. I was one of many and, and there, you know, I still have friends who are, who are there. You know, they left their day job, they're mobilized. Um, I was fortunate to come back because my mission was done. And my general said, hey, if we, if we just keep people around, we're not gonna wind this down. 
Um, so I got sent back to my job. Yeah. Well, great. Teresa, did you have a, a question or comment for Colby? I, I do actually, Colby, again and again, you always um, are unbelievably impactful um, with your acts of kindness and leave a lasting impression. And just going back on all the key, the, the key statements that you met, uh, that, that you presented us today, one of my favorite stories from that evening all those years ago was was your story about the M&Ms and it was to me it's such a perfect example of how you so kindly faced adversity and and turned a situation into something that was so again impactful do you have a minute to share that story yeah yeah you bet thank you and then if I remember right you and your husband after hearing the story gave me a like a king size bag of peanut M&Ms to to drive it home, uh, so it was pretty neat. Yeah, so, so General Brown, in, in speaking that evening, told the story of when he came and visited me, and and how uh, he was meeting with some of the the tribal leaders who I've been working with, and and it was Christmas, it was Christmas Day, and in meeting with this tribal leader, um, General Brown wanted to give this this Afghan something, and I just received my Christmas package from home, and I had in my Next, in my ammo pouch, I had some M&Ms and some ammunition, but I had some M&Ms. And General Brown looked, and then I gave him my bag of peanut M&Ms, and General Brown ceremoniously presented those as one of my treasured gifts from America to this tribal leader, and, and it was received with, with great respect. And um, you know, we kind of had to chuckle at the, how peanut M&Ms carried the day on that particular day, but, but they did, and so yeah. And then Teresa gave me a huge bag and, <laughs> at, at that event, so that was fun. <laughs> yeah, that was it. I just I love that that story. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, that's great. We did get a. Uh, it's not a question, but there's a comment, Colby, in in the chat box. Um, it's from Lisa DeMarinay. She's the great friend of the Vegas Chamber, and she serves on our Government Affairs Committee. She says, thank you for your service. My grandfather served in the Army in engineering in World War II, and my dad was a medic in Vietnam and then in the reserves. I'm eternally grateful to our veterans. So thank you very much. We do have a, a question as well. Um, an anonymous attendee, how do you recommend leaders navigate balancing emotional fatigue and lack of work-life balance within their teams? Well, I, I think unbalance happens when you let it happen. Everyone has 24 hours, the same 24 hours in the day as everyone else. Um, so as a leader, it's important if, if the demand on your time is, is so critical and so much that, that, that you have to deliberately program in time for yourself, time to get back in balance. Um, I, I learned really this at, at, in the Pentagon. My, my uh, admiral and then later general's uh, calendars were programmed by the 15-minute increments. But they programmed time to work out program time to be at their desk where nobody could bother them. They knew, everyone knew this was the general's desk time or the general was at the gym. Um, so I think when, when that emotional strain or that unbalance enters into one's schedule, then as the leader, as the person who can influence it, you just have to take charge. You have to be deliberate and program that time in so that those around you can have, have certainty. I, I think, um, that, uh, that tension arises when, when those who are looking to you for leadership don't, don't see you taking those deliberate steps. If, if you program in time, uh, hey, tonight is my date night with my wife, I'm leaving at five. If, if you don't start and put those markers down, then your those who follow you are not going to as well. Um, the army is infamous for, hey, and in the infantry, all of our weapons are cleaned, everything's turned in, we're all done, but nobody's going home because the commander's still in his office. And the platoon leaders are too scared to say, hey, sir, we're, we're done, can we go? But if the commander leaves, then whew, okay, we're all going home. So I think as a leader, just being delivered about how you program your day can help maintain that balance for you and those that you lead. I couldn't agree with you more being intentional about how we plan our day and how we manage that because it's easy to just constantly work and never shut it off. But then unfortunately we don't get a chance to recharge our batteries. So. Yeah. All right. 
Well, Colby Jenkins, thank you again so much, my friend, for joining us today. We're thrilled to have you. You've just given us an amazing food for thought. We appreciate your insights. Uh, uh, Chamber Board Trustee Teresa DiLoretto with the Nevada Military Support Alliance. We can't tell you how much we support uh, and appreciate your uh, leadership and your participation on, on the Chamber Board of Trustees. And uh, just want to thank everybody, all of our members for being with us today and for your membership at the Vegas Chamber and everybody have a, a wonderful and safe day. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.